I'll get it. Thank you. Um, yes, as Tiago mentioned, I, I work at an agency called Clear Left in, in Brighton in England. Um, and we're very much a design agency, a UX agency. Uh, hire us if you've got uh, thorny design problems that need solving. We're available now for bargain basement Brexit prices. Um, <laughs> But I'm, I'm sort of more on the, on the technology side of things at Clear Left. I'm kind of research and development arm of Clear Left, looking into, into front end development and, and emerging technologies, things like that. And I know we've got a nice mixture of designers and developers here today, but if it's, if it's okay with you, I'd like to start by showing some code. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna see some code. Uh, this is code. This is literally a picture of code. Uh, this is uh, in the code base of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, and it is quite literally a photograph of DNA, a photograph of code. It was taken, this is the photograph 51, it was taken by Rosalind Franklin, this amazing X-ray crystallographer. And you can browse her notebooks online, you can see as she begins to decode this code base of deoxyribonucleic acid, right? We've got this. So it's not like we work with binary every day with computers, base two. This is a base four code base, right? Adenine, cytosine, guanine, tynine. Four building blocks. And yet from those four simple building blocks, we get all life on this planet. Every single human being, but also every single dog, every single cat, every single elephant, every single bird, every single lizard, every single insect, all sharing the same code base. So it's an incredibly diverse range of life, evolving and growing through natural selection. And yet, you start to see trends, among, even amongst such a diverse planet full of life. You see trends towards specialization, life getting really good at one thing. Uh, a trend towards uh, ubiquity, life wanting to spread. Right? And interestingly, it's a, a trend towards cooperation, where the actions of a group can be greater than the actions of an individual. Now, um, the thing about this, this fantastic code base that, that's grown and spread in this amazing way is that the process, which is amazing, is evolution. Evolution through natural selection. Selecting for, for fitness, right? We like to think that we're the most highly evolved species on the planet, but the truth is that every species that's still around is the most highly evolved species for its environment, right? We're not special in that way. But there is one way we've kind of uh, found a way to hack the process of evolution through natural selection. Because it's, it's kind of a messy and slow and long process. Um, and we found a way to sort of get a heads up on it, right? Instead of waiting for mutations and selecting the right mutations for our environment, we can, we can create advantages for ourselves, and that's through technology. So it's through technology that we can augment ourselves. This is a, a very old example of technology. It's an Australian hand axe. And when man was able to carve an axe like this, uh, he was able to get you know, a, a sharp cutting tool at the end of a limb without having to evolve a sharp cutting tool at the end of a limb. And now he has the power of having that sharp cutting tool. And we shape our tools, thereafter the tools shape us. And it's pretty much been like that for the history of of our species. Here's a more recent example of a technology, right? Uh, the pencil, great piece of technology, I think you'll agree, right? It's got a very clear affordance, you know which bit you're supposed to use. It has uh, an undo, which is very handy. And it has a built-in progress bar, which is <laughs> particularly useful. And what's interesting, if you start to look at the trends in technology, you see some overlap with the trends in biology because you see these trends towards specialization, towards ubiquity, towards cooperation. So the pencil is really good at doing one thing, right? Drawing. And you can find the pencil all over the planet, more or less unchanged. And really interestingly, cooperation. There's this famous book by uh, Leonard Klein called I Pencil. And it's written from the point of view of a pencil. And the whole point of the book is that no person can make a pencil. No single person, no single human being. It requires cooperation, right? To get the graphite, to fell the trees, to make the wood, to carve it, to put it all together. It requires cooperation. And that's pretty much true of any kind of technology. It's very, very hard to do it by yourself. And you get real economies of scale once you start to cooperate. I mean, you can try to make technology by yourself, but you're going to have a bad time. Like there was this English artist, Thomas Twaits. 
You might have seen his most recent project where he tried to live for a year as a goat. But this is from a while back where he tried to make a toaster from scratch. It's called a toaster project. And he literally wanted to make everything from scratch, right? He wanted to smelt his own steel. He wanted to make the plastic, the wiring, everything from scratch. It didn't really turn out that great, as you can see. It barely worked for a second. And it was prohibitively expensive. So when it comes to technology, I think we really have to cooperate. But one thing I want to caution against is when we see these similarities between the world of biology and the world of technology, specialization, ubiquity, cooperation, it might be tempting to think that it's the same process at work. But there's a big difference. Like I say, the process of evolution through natural selection is slow. It requires, on mis it requires mistakes to get uh, selected for. There isn't a plan in place there, right? Nature doesn't plan an elephant. Nature doesn't plan a human. It's just that happens to be the current outcome for the environment that's been selected. Whereas with technology, we can plan, we can think, we can imagine something we want to exist in the world and then create it. That's quite a big difference. Uh, and there's whole different schools of thought, of design when it comes to technology and imagining what we want to put into the world, what we want to create. M one of my favorite schools of thought is Chindogu. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. Started in Japan, Kenji Kawakami. It's, it's this school of thought where uh, it's got a design philosophy, and the design philosophy is that these, these tools should be not exactly useful, but not altogether useless. Um, I'll, I'll show you what I mean, right? These things where you look at them and you think, oh, that's just crazy, but then you're like, is it though? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I look at these things like, oh, that's mad, but well, actually, you know, can, could I imagine using this? You know, why not? Why not uh, keep your shoes dry in the rain? And it makes sense. Why not harness the kinetic power of your toddler to clean the floors? And if you don't have a child, that's okay. You know, you can, you can port it over. Um, but the thing with these things, like, it, you can't really imagine people actually using them in the world, right, in a social space. Like, I was looking through the uh, book of Chindogu from 1995, and I found this crazy device. It's kind of like a stick you can put a camera on so you can take self-portrait pictures with. I just can't imagine anybody really using this in the real world. But whether, when you look at technology, whether, whether it's uh, chindogu or it's toasters or it's pencils or it's Ashwellian hand axes, it kind of follows the same trend for much of our history, which is you have the hardware and you have the human. The human is augmenting themselves by creating hardware. And then something interesting happened in the 20th century. So where we got a new layer in between the hardware and the software. The, sorry, the hardware and the human, which is software, right? So now the human can interact with software and the software interacts with the hardware, and vice versa. Uh, and like I say, I think this has just been a growing trend uh, since the 20th century, when we got computers. And uh, probably the best example of this would be uh, the Apollo missions, right? Putting people on the moon. It required incredible cooperation of hardware, of software, of human. By the way, seeing as we were just looking at selfie sticks, I should point out that this is one of the very few examples of an everyone else -y. This is a picture taken by Michael Collins, and it can, you, it's a picture of Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, and every single human being in the world, except for Michael Collins. It's an everyone else -y. Anyway, the Apollo landings required incredible uh, uh, human beings, right, the astronauts. It required incredible hardware, the Saturn V rocket, and it required incredible software created by Margaret Hamilton, right, the, working on the, the flight software, creating entire schools of thought for software engineering. Although, as Frank rightly acknowledges, there was pioneering work done in the Mercury missions by chimpanzees as well. Now, if you look at this trend of the hardware, the software, the human, you start to see that the hardware over time becomes less and less important, and it's the software that sort of takes center stage. The hardware, the ideal situation is that the hardware becomes irrelevant, right? Design dissolving in behavior. And if you think about it, this idea that the hardware should be irrelevant was sort of the driving force behind the World Wide Web when Tim Berners-Lee is working at CERN, right? The European Center of Nuclear Research. And everyone there at CERN is using different operating systems. There's no, there's no hierarchy there. You can't tell people they have to use a particular uh, computer. Right? They'll use whatever computer they want. And it, he still wants people to be able to collaborate, right? to, to work together, and he wants to make the hardware irrelevant. And he, he creates the World Wide Web. Right? And the World Wide Web is this classic example of a technology that is building on top of the technologies that have come before. 
You can't, have, you can't have Twitter and Facebook without having the World Wide Web, but you can't have the World Wide Web without having the Internet. You can't have the Internet without you know, computers. We can't have computers without electricity. You need the Industrial Revolution to get to electricity. Right, standing on the shoulders of giants all the way down. Um, Stephen Johnson has this idea of the adjacent possible, how some things you know, have to wait for the right time to be created. Like you can't create a microwave oven in 15th century Holland because not enough things have happened first to make the microwave oven possible. So the World Wide Web is a classic example of this. And the World Wide Web itself is, is really a set of agreements, right? A set of, of ideas. You've got HTTP, the Hypertext tr Transfer Protocol. Uh, you've got URLs for addressing. And this uh, is a simple format, HTML. And they're pretty good, I would say. They're not the best formats ever created. Uh, see, the thing is not to create the best you know, formats or protocols or ideas. The thing is you've got to convince people to use them. Convincing people to use the technology you've created, that's the hard part. And whenever I think about, you know, you've got to convince people to use your stuff, I always think of, uh, of Grace Hopper, the brilliant computer scientist who invented the compiler, right, and co-created the COBOL programming language. And she used to be very frustrated by inertia in the workplace. You know, she would say that um, the most dangerous phrase in the English language is, we've always done it that way. Right? So she was really frustrated by this fact, and she used to say, humans are allergic to change. Right? And I think she's onto something there. Humans are allergic to change. And Tim Berners-Lee was aware of this when he was creating the World Wide Web. Whereas Grace Hopper tried to fight that fact that humans are allergic to change. Tim Berners-Lee was kind of going with it. Right? So each one of these building blocks of his project built on something that people were already familiar with. So HTTP, you know, obviously, is going to build it on top of the internet. So the existing work by Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf with TCP IP. And URLs use the domain name system that John Postel has come up with, because that's what people are used to. And then there's HTML, right? This, this simple format for documents. Well, he based that on a format that was already being used by everyone at CERN called SGML. In fact, if you were to take a look at the tags in SGML documents being used at CERN at the time, you would have seen these tags. These are all from CERN SGML. And Tim Berners-Lee just took them wholesale. In fact, you could take an SGML document, change the file extension to .htm, and it would work in a web browser. People were familiar with it, and that's how he convinced them to get adoption, right? Now, of course, since then, we've been able to add more elements to HTML. We got more semantic richness, able to mark up our documents with more meaning, and that's, that's good, but where it gets really interesting is when you get the powerful elements, the elements that have behavior baked in. If the browser understands these elements, then you get things like video and canvas and audio, right? responsive images with the picture element. And all of these share a design pattern. All of these were created in such a way that you, as the author, can provide fallback content for older browsers that don't understand these tags yet inside the opening and closing video tag or audio tag or canvas element, you can put fallback content for older browsers. And that is not an accident. That is a design decision. And there are design principles that guide those kind of decisions. Design principles that say we should consider this, that web content can degrade gracefully in older or less capable user agents. Right? HTML design, I'm kind of fascinated by design principles. So, that, that brings up an important lesson, I think, when it comes to technology, is that our immediate reaction is to ask, how well does it work? This technology that we're thinking of using, this new HTML element or JavaScript API or piece of CSS, we ask, how well does it work? And that is a good question to ask, but I think there's a more important question to ask, and it's this. How well does it fail? And we saw this yesterday when Rachel was talking about CSS Grid, that it's been designed to fail well, that you can build in such a way that you can provide the fallback. And the new shiny stuff will work very well alongside uh, the, the old ways of doing things. It's been designed to fail well. So I think this is a good lens we could apply to the technologies we work with today. Let's ask this question of some of our technologies. Let's start with, um, let's start with CSS shapes. Who's, who's uh, heard of CSS shapes? Some people, who's using CSS shapes? Few people, okay. So one of the things you might do if you're, you've, you've heard about a technology, maybe at a conference, you go to canIuse.com and you see what the browser support is like. And you'll see some green and you'll see some red. 
And based on the amount of red or green, you might decide whether or not to use that technology. You're kind of asking there, how well does it work? What's the support like? But what this does not show you is how well does it fail? So in the case of CSS shapes, let's take a look at that. Here it is working. I'm using shape outside circle. So that you see the way the text kind of curves around the circular image there? That's using CSS shapes. OK, that's how well it works, but how well does it fail? What happens in a browser that doesn't support CSS shapes? Well, you get this. The text goes in a straight line, which is pretty much what I would have done anyway. So in this situation, I would say it fails really well. It's not a big deal. There isn't any harm being done. Uh, by, uh, by using CSS shapes. So this is a simple example, but I'd say it's an example of something that fails well, and therefore you could use, even if only one or two browsers supported it, it would make sense. OK, so let's, let's, let's look at some other technologies that you might be uh, evaluating. Service workers, Vitaly mentioned them yesterday. Who's heard of service workers? OK, and who's using service workers? Right, far fewer. So many of you have heard of service workers. Not that many of you are using service workers. You're evaluating the technology. So you might be wondering, how well does it work? Right? Uh, by the way, service workers is this amazing technology. I don't want to go into the detail. Vitaly mentioned yesterday every website should have a service worker. I kind of agree. Um, they, there can be this enormous performance uh, boost, uh, but also they allow you to have uh, nifty custom offline pages. Like The Guardian has an offline page where you can play a crossword puzzle if you can't get to that article you're trying to read. Um, it's, it's a really cool technology. It's hard to get your head around what a service worker is because it's kind of like, like this thing that gets installed on the user's browser, um, sort of like a cookie, except it can execute JavaScript, so it's more like a virus that you've installed. <laughs> but it's a good virus. It's like. You're doing a man-in-the-middle attack on your own website, right? Before a request even hits your server, the service worker can execute some code and say, no, no, don't go to the server. Look in the cache or show this instead, right? Very powerful, but a little, a little hard to get your head around. Um, so how does it work, right? How well do service workers work? Well, like I say, um, good, but you, you have to learn. A, you know, there's a learning curve. Just getting your head around it and then writing the actual code, you get nothing for free. And you might go to Can I Use and see what's the browser support like. And say, yeah, It's pretty good, it's getting better all the time, but there's, some, there's red as well as green. Now, as we saw with CSS shapes, that doesn't tell us the whole story. That doesn't tell us how well does it fail. So, how well do service workers fail? And this is where I think service workers are absolutely brilliant. They've basically been designed so that you have to use them as an enhancement. Because like I said, the way a service worker works is the user visits your website, and then the service worker gets installed in their browser. But that first step, when the user visits your website, obviously there can't be a service worker. So for that first visit, no browser supports service workers. You have to consider that first use case. It's really hard to make a website that relies on a service worker. But it's very easy to make a website that uses a service worker as an enhancement, as a performance boost, right? And because of that, there is absolutely no harm to the browsers that don't support service workers. They just continue as normal. But you're giving this great boost to the browsers that do support service workers. So I think that design of service workers is absolutely brilliant. They are designed to fail well. It's superb. So like Vitaly, in case you hadn't guessed, I, I'd also encourage you to investigate service workers, put them on your website. They're, they're fantastic. I've I kind of got religion when it's come to service workers. All right, let's, let's look at another technology, a sort of buzzwordy technology like service workers. Web components. Who's heard of web components? Quite a few. Who is using web components in production? I didn't think so. <laughs> yeah, well, not many. Um, the web components are a weird one because they're not really a technology. Web components is this umbrella term for a whole bunch of separate specifications, like custom elements. Um, there's HTML templates, uh, the very sinister sounding shadow DOM. Um, and the idea is that uh, you kind of get to make your own standards. So when we saw these, these very powerful HTML elements, video, canvas, audio, they're great, but it took time to get to them. In a way, you know, this is like the process of evolution through natural selection. We have to petition the browser makers, the standards bodies show that we want this, and over time we finally get these powerful elements into our browsers. And the idea with, uh, with web components is let's expose the, the DNA of the browser to developers and let developers just create their own elements 
their own elements with behavior and with styling built in, right? Um, and, and the powerful part is that the behavior and the styling that goes with any of these elements you've made up is encapsulated, that that behavior, that JavaScript, that CSS doesn't leak out. You finally get encapsulation. I mean, this is, this is kind of the, the problem that React is trying to solve in all of these frameworks and this whole move towards components and, and modular uh, development is, is, is to get that encapsulation. Now, of course, if you go and use a custom element like this, you just make it up and you put it on your page, you're basically adding a span, right? It doesn't do anything. You then have to give it the behavior, give it the styling that you want it to have and sort of raise it up to become this new element. So the idea of web components, very powerful, encapsulated, powerful little things that you could just drop in, right? Uh, how, well, how well does it work? Well, again, you might, like I said, it's multiple specifications. You might look up one of those specifications and can I use like custom elements? Go, I don't know, the browser support's not looking great. But then you remember, we looked at CSS shapes, we looked at service worker, and browser support doesn't mean anything because they're designed to fail well. So you ask the question, how well do web components fail? And that's where it gets interesting because the answer to the question, how well do web components fail, is it depends. Depends entirely on how you're designing your web components. So let's say you're making this cool carousel -y image gallery animated swishy shiny thing, right? An image gallery element, and you design it in this way so that you, the images in the gallery are in the markup, right? They're in the page. Well, this will fail very well because if a browser doesn't support custom elements or any of the other parts of web components, they can still get the images. Maybe they don't get the, the, the shiny carousel part, but they still get the content, right? So this is designed well, this will fail well. But when I see web components out in the wild or in tutorials and examples, this is what I see. Opening tag, closing tag, and no thought given for how well it fails. And this is a real shame. Now the good news is it's early days yet with web components, right? None of us are implementing them yet. So maybe we could set the tone. We could have design principles for making web components so that we ensure that they fail well, which I think is a way to get things adopted, right? I think service workers will get adoption because it's been designed to fail well. But I do get disheartened when I see the, the sort of the poster children for web components that are out there now, right? So the Polymer project, which is a library of web components, they've built a whole shop using web components. But if you view source, this is what's actually in the source. It'll be an open body tag, a closing body tag, and in between a shop app element with nothing inside it and then there's a script. And that script is where all the magic happens. That script is the single point of failure. Right? It does not fail well. That's a real shame. But like I said, it's, it's, it's still soon. Right? It's not too late. We could change the course of how we use web components. And when you're, when you're evaluating technologies like this, there's another question to ask. Right? You're being, you're trying to, someone's trying to convince you to use a technology. Ask yourself, who benefits? Who benefits from the technology that you may or may not adopt? Uh, and when it comes to the web, I would say that there tends to be sort of two sides of the seesaw of who might benefit from a technology. That's developers and users. Now, nine times out of ten, the technology benefits both, right? It's fine for developers, it's good for users, great. You know, you look at something like um, service workers, it's a huge benefit for users because, you know, they get the offline usage, they get the performance boost, it's great. It's actually a bit of a penalty for developers because now you've got to learn something new. How do the service workers work, right? You've got to, you've got to put the time in and, and write your script. But I tend to fall down on the side of, of favoring users over developers. Call me crazy. I mean, I'm a developer and I want my life to be easy. I like developer convenience, but not at the cost of the users. I think the users got to come first. In fact, talking about the HTML design principles, my favorite design principle, because I'm such a nerd, I have a favorite design principle, <laughs> is in the HTML design principles, there's the priority of constituencies, which states, in case of conflict, consider users over authors, over specifiers, over theoretical purity, right? So users come before us. We're the authors, and the users always come first. And I, I kind of agree with that. But still, there's different kinds of technologies we use, different kinds of tools, and I think we can have different criteria when we're evaluating different tools. Let me try and explain what I mean, because I'm trying to come up with a vocabulary for this. And the best way I can think of it is kind of like the tools we use internally on our own laptops, our own machines, and the tools that are external, that directly touch the user. So an example of the, the internal tools, I would say, are things like preprocessors and, and build tools and version control, right? They help you work 
better, they're an accelerant, but ultimately what they produce is still HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Right? And when it comes to any of these sort of internal tools, my philosophy, my attitude is whatever works for you. Right? Uh, whatever you think works, use it. Use one of them, use none of them, use all of them, go crazy. Right? Or, or better yet, what works for your team. Right? This is something that Brad is going to talk about later when getting the consensus about which tools to use. So the criteria when it comes to these internal tools is entirely based on your outlook. Right? But I don't think those same criteria should apply when you're talking about tools that directly affect the user. So CSS frameworks are written in CSS. JavaScript libraries are written in JavaScript. And for you, the developer, to get the benefit, the user has to download that library or that framework. There's a tax on the user for your benefit. And there, I think, we can't simply apply the criteria of, hey, whatever you like, right? whatever works for you. Interestingly, some of these JavaScript libraries, right? Angular, React, they've kind of shifted over to being internal tools. Like when you can have them render on the server, you get all the benefit of the design of the framework without having the user pay that tax. I think that's a really interesting trend to see the way things move from the client to the server so that you can apply that criterion of whatever works for you. So these sort of outward-facing tools, I think we need to evaluate differently. Now, you could say that all these tools affect the user, right? Because anything that makes a developer work better automatically is better for the user experience, et cetera. But I think I'm talking here about things that directly touch the user. And when you're evaluating those kind of tools, of course, there's all sorts of questions to ask, right? Well, what's the browser support like, right? You'd be going on, can I use to check that? Um, What's the, what's the file size? Like, how big is that library or framework that the user is going to have to download? Uh, what's the community like? Will you get answers to your questions? These are all really important questions to ask of, of any of these technologies, but not the most important question. Because the most important question of any of these tools is, what are the assumptions? What assumptions have been baked into the tool? Assumptions so deep that maybe the author didn't even realize they were there. Because I guarantee you the assumptions are there. I know the assumptions are there because all these tools are created by human beings. And human beings have assumptions, biases. Software, like all technologies, is inherently political. We can't help but imbue our values into what we make. That applies for tools, it applies for software. We like to talk about opinionated software, but the truth is all software is opinionated. You can try to make unopinionated software. It's really, really hard, right? You, you can't help but build something in there. This is how we get to that situation where you got you know, one group of developers saying, yeah, this library or framework, it really rocks. And another group of saying, no, this, this library or framework sucks. And how can they both be right? And yet they are because it's entirely down to how well the philosophy of the tool matches your own philosophy. These are tools that are supposed to augment you, help you work better. If the philosophy of a tool matches your own philosophy, it works as that accelerant, you work faster. If the philosophy of the tool clashes with your own philosophy, you're gonna have a hard time working with that tool. So technologies do have this inherent bias, but I don't wanna make out like we can't twist them to our own ends. The technologies may be created for one purpose and end up being used for a completely different purpose. Like when Alexander Graham Bell uh, created the telephone, he thought that people would listen to concerts at a distance. Meanwhile, Thomas Edison, with the phonograph, he thought that people would record conversations, right? One side of a conversation, then you send the record over to someone else. And those two technologies ended up being used for the exact opposite purpose, right? Well, my favorite example from history of a technology that, that sort of found its use comes from, again, during World War II. Uh, Hedy Lamarr, star of uh, Silver Screen in the first half of the 20th century, she's, in, uh, she's married to an Austrian arms dealer. After the Anschluss, she's kind of trapped in Germany. She manages to get to America, which is a whole adventure in itself, and she wants to do her bit for the war effort, particularly after a refugee ship full of children sunk by a, a German U-boat. And... The problem with taking out the U-boats is these torpedoes are radio-guided, right? So you got the controller using radio to, to, to uh, guide a torpedo. But if the enemy managed to uh, find the frequency of the radio controller, they can jam it, and now you can't guide the torpedo anymore. So Hedy Lamarr worked with a composer called George Antiel to come up with a system inspired by player pianos where the frequency being used by the controller and by the torpedo would hop and change really quickly. And so now it's much harder to jam that transmission. Okay, but what does uh, a technology for 
getting U-boats in World War II, uh, what does that have to do with us today? Well, with you, I'm pretty sure you've got devices that have uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, and every single one of those technologies makes use of frequency hopping. This is a technology that sort of found its way later in the 20th century. Like this, 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 our, our world is filled with these technologies, and when you look back at the history of technology, it can sometimes be overwhelming. Like it seems like, like they were inevitable, right? I, I showed you how the web had to, you know, wait for the internet, which had to wait for computers, which wait for electricity. And if you run that in reverse, you can think, well, you know, the internet was inevitable once we had electricity and computers, and then the web was inevitable once we had the internet. I don't think that's true. I don't think the, the specifics are true. Right? Uh, something like the web was inevitable. Something like the internet was inevitable. Not the web we got. Not the internet we got. And I hate this idea that, there's, there's, you know, that the technology is the driving force, that we don't have the agency. And this sees its ultimate expression in this idea of technological determinism. That it's technology itself which is driving our history. Right? Take the, it's the future, take it, right? There's nothing you can do about it, except that these things are coming, you're getting your drones and your self-driving cars and, and all the latest technology, we're just along for the ride. I don't, I don't like that feeling, right? It makes me feel disempowered. Well, what if it's true? What if technology is the driving force? I don't think it is. There's a, an author named Kevin Kelly, he was editor at Wired magazine, and he writes these books which sound like they're very technologically deterministic because they have these titles like uh, What Technology Wants and The Inevitable, right? It seems like, oh yeah, the tsunami of technology coming our way, there's nothing you can do about it. But actually his point is more subtle. He says, yes, there is an inevitable tide. These, these things are coming, but we are the ones who shape it. Technology is not destiny. Right? That we, we get to shape the future. And Kevin Kelly, when you look at him, you know, wise looking man, you might think he's Amish. He's not Amish. But he spent time with the Amish and he describes himself as being Amish ish. Because <laughs> he learns from the Amish, who get a very bad deal when it comes to technology. The idea that the Amish reject technology is simply not true. Instead, the Amish evaluate technology and they do it at their own pace. They, they are steadily adopting technology at their pace. They are slow geeks. As Frank scientifically proved yesterday with the tortoise and the hare, I think we could all benefit from being slow geeks and being Amish-ish, taking our time and asking questions of our technology. Now, we shouldn't be Amish-ish in our you know, facial hair or fashion sense, no, but in the questions we ask. Questions of technology like, uh, how well does it work? Obviously, is it, gonna, is it gonna be useful for you? But more importantly, how well does it fail? To ask of the technology you're being sold, to ask who benefits from this technology? Maybe favor users over developers if you have that choice. And most importantly of all, to ask what are the assumptions in this technology? So you can then perhaps work around those assumptions, find the true use for that technology. Because when I look back at the sweep of history, I don't see technology as the driving force behind everything that's come before. I see people as the driving force. These, these people created the world we have today. And they are remarkable people, it's true. But people nonetheless. And you know who else is remarkable? You're remarkable. I'm looking forward to the future that you make. It shouldn't be, it's the future, take it. It's the future, make it. Obrigado.